In the last video we saw how nucleotides are assembled from a phosphate, a sugar and a base. Now we're going to look at how polynucleotides are formed. They're formed by the condensation of individual nucleotides to make a polymer. The phosphate of one nucleotide joins to the sugar of another nucleotide. This forms a phosphodiester bond. On the diagram, I've highlighted the atoms that are eliminated. So the OH from the phosphate group and the hydrogen that's part of the sugar are eliminated they, during the condensation reaction and the two nucleotides are joined together and water is formed. The DNA polymer has a regular repeating backbone of sugars and phosphates and the variable part of the DNA polymer is the bases which are attached to the sugars in the chains. So this diagram shows the repetition of the sugars and phosphates and then B represents the bases which varies as you go down the chain. The diagram shows a single strand of the DNA polymer. Probably the most important thing in A-level chemistry with regard to DNA is to understand how the three parts of the nucleotides join together and how the nucleotides hydrogen bond, which we'll deal with in the next section. What I've done here is pasted in the diagram from the data sheet and highlighted the atoms that, where, the, where the different parts join. So the phosphate joins to the sugar by eliminating the yellow atoms. The sugar joins to the base by eliminating the green atoms and the purple ones are involved in hydrogen bonding which we'll discuss next. I strongly suggest that you get your data sheet and use a three coloured highlighters to highlight the atoms as I have done. DNA exists in nature as a double helix with two polynucleotide strands wrapped around each other. This was the structure that Watson and Crick's worked out nearly 70 years ago now. And there's a local aspect to this story as the first pictures of DNA were taken at Leeds University. The diagram shows a schematic representation of the structure of the DNA. So you've got the double helix with the blue ribbon representing the sugar phosphate backbone and the bases are at 90 degrees to the axis of the double helix. The two strands of the DNA are held together by hydrogen bonds between the bases. Each base can only hydrogen bond to one particular partner. So adenine always hydrogen bonds to thymine and cytosine hydrogen bonds to guanine. When we're drawing diagrams of hydrogen bonds, if you remember, there's three things that you need to show. You've got to show the lone pairs and the dipoles. You need to have the hydrogen bond, which you label, and the hydrogen bond has to pass through the lone pair, and it should be linear, so that the three atoms involved are all lined up in a straight line. And this is really important in biology. The the fact that the hydrogen bonds have to be straight, that's what makes, um, which causes a discrimination, so that A only hydrogen bonds with T and G always hydrogen bonds with C. If you had other pairs of, of bases, they wouldn't have groups in the right place to form the hydrogen bonds. I've added the necessary information to the AT base pair. So we have 
the dipole on the bonds. You need to have dipoles in both molecules involved in the hydrogen bonds. I've added the lone pairs. The oxygen has two lone pairs. And I've added the hydrogen bonds, the dashed red line. And as you can see, the hydrogen bonds goes between the delta positive hydrogen and the delta negative oxygen through one of the lone pairs. And the nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen are all lined up. We say they're collinear, they're in a straight line. A makes two hydrogen bonds with T. Guanine makes three hydrogen bonds with cytosine. So stop the video and add the dipoles, the lone pairs and the hydrogen bonds and label them for the bottom diagram. I've now added the dipoles, the lone pairs and the hydrogen bonds to the GC base pair. If you look at the base pairs, you can see that the groups that are involved in hydrogen bonding are diagonally opposite the nitrogen that is bonded to the sugar. This makes sense if you think about the structure of the double helix. The sugar is part of the phosphate sugar backbone and the bases have to stick out inside the double helix, the base pair with the base on the other strand of the DNA. If we go back to our diagram of the bases, the, the atoms that are involved in hydrogen bonding are shown in purple and you can see that they're opposites in the molecules from the atoms that are involved in the condensation reaction to join to the sugar, which are shown in green. G and C have three groups of atoms that, that form the three hydrogen bonds. A and T have two groups of atoms that form hydrogen bonds. The two strands of the DNA are complementary to one another. And this is arises from the base pairing. Only thymine has the correct atoms in the right place to hydrogen bond with adenine, and only guanine has the correct atoms in the right place to hydrogen bond to cysteine. Other base pair combinations wouldn't place the atoms in the correct distance or correct alignment to hydrogen bond properly. And this is the way that genes are replicated correctly. The information to produce all the proteins in your cell is encoded in the DNA and each section of DNA that encodes a single protein is called a gene. DNA can be copied, that's called replication which occurs during cell division and it can also be transcribed where a copy of the DNA is made into RNA and that's used as a template for producing proteins. Whenever the DNA is replicated or transcribed the two chains of the double helix have to separate and that can occur because the base pairs are held together with hydrogen bonds which are weaker than the covalent bonds that hold the nucleotides together in the polynucleotide chain.